Good afternoon or good morning wherever you happen to be. Welcome to the European Space Agency's Mars Google Plus Hangout. My name is Daniel Skuka. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm speaking to you from the European Space Agency's Space Operations Center in Darmstadt, Germany. We've got a fabulous program planned for you today and uh, we have a number of special guests which uh, without too much further ado I want to begin uh, to introduce. First of all, I'd like to start with my co-moderator, uh, Emily Baldwin, who is ASA's science editor, and Emily joins us from ESA's Space Technology Center in Noordwijk, the Netherlands. Uh, hello, Emily Baldwin, do you hear us? Hi, Daniel. Yes, we're getting you loud and clear from EsTech. Good stuff. Thank you very much for joining us today. And Emily, you've got, uh, you've got someone there beside you. I wonder if you could uh, introduce uh, 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 that person sitting uh, just uh, in front of the model of Phobos behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Olivier Vitas. He's our ESA Mars Express project scientist. And uh, yes, and also introducing a model of Phobos as well. Okay, great. I'm going to ask you if actually if Olivier could move just a little bit closer towards you. He's, he's, he's halfway off the screen. He's a little bit cut off. And uh, I think we need to... Uh, yeah, that, that's perfect. Good. Great. Um, I would like to introduce now uh, the gentleman sitting beside me. This is uh, Michel Denis. Hello, Michel. Hi. Michel Denis is the uh, Mars Express Spacecraft Operations Manager here at ESOC, and he has been for quite some time. And uh, he also has a second role that he's uh, fulfilling these days. He is the ground segment manager for the upcoming ExoMars mission. That's true. Michel, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. We're actually uh, webcasting to you, or Google Hangout casting to you uh, live from the Mars Express dedicated control room here in uh, ESOC. Uh, you'll hear some noise in the background. You'll hear some, uh, some discussion on the voice loop, speaking to the ground stations. We actually have a pass ongoing right now with Mars Express. We're live to the spacecraft uh, via ASA's S-Track Next network. And in just a little while, uh, that pass will end, and I think we're switching over to NASA DSN which we, uh, we often share the, uh, the connections. Right, today is the opening, the first day of World Space Week. So welcome to uh, World Space Week as well. And there's a fabulous range of activities going on. This is certainly going to be one of ASA's uh, uh, ways to celebrate World Space Week. Um, <clears throat> the hashtag that uh, you can follow for World Space Week is, of course, WSW2013. The hashtag for today's uh, Google Plus Hangout is uh, Mars Chat, and we'll be keeping our eye on Twitter, we'll be keeping our eye in the Google Plus channel. We're looking for questions already. Uh, we've seen a, questions, a few questions being posted, that's great. And uh, as, we, uh, as we see que questions coming up, we'll pass them over to our, to our guests. Before we get started, I want to uh, uh, introduce uh, our third special guest, which uh, I almost uh, forgot, but uh, how can I forget? Who has woken up very early in the morning, it's uh, 7 a.m., uh, on the West Coast. We are joined today by Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society. Emily, thank you very much for joining us and for getting out of bed so early. It's a pleasure to be here and it's fun to have the reminder that we're on a round planet after all as the sun is just rising here in Southern California. Good stuff. You're, 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 you're smiling. You obviously had coffee, so that's uh, you're, you're, you're welcome. Good. Okay, I'm just going to take a look down at the screen and uh, see what I see. I think we're pretty much ready to go. We've got about uh, 73 viewers watching us right now, which is great. Uh, to all of you out there in the Internet, thank you very much for joining us. We'll start off with uh, our, our program today, and I'll pass over to my co-moderator, Emily Baldwin. Yeah, well, uh, as I'm sure everyone's aware, this year celebrates 10 years since the launch of Mars Express. So part of our activities earlier this year was marking that occasion by kind of looking back and seeing not only what the highlights have been, but what we can still expect from Mars Express. So perhaps Olivier can begin by giving us a few of his own highlights of some of the scientific discoveries that, uh, that Mars Express has achieved in the last decade. OK, so good morning and good afternoon, everybody. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to share uh, what we have done with Mars Express after 10 years. It's always surprising that we can talk about a mission after 10 years, and we are very happy to be there. So as Emily said, we have just celebrated a, a few months ago the 10 years anniversary of the launch. Uh, there are a few milestones ahead of us, but that was a very important one. And at this uh, occasion, um, we wanted to share the highlight of the mission. So what I think is important to know is that after 10 years, uh, Mars Express have observed Mars globally. 
with our special orbit, and Michel Denis could talk later about uh, this very peculiar orbit, we have been able to see almost all Mars at all seasons and at all uh, local times, so I mean during the day, during the night, at the terminator, and it's very important for our science. And what is also very important to notice is that with our uh, instrument, we have been able to observe almost all of Mars, except probably the interior. But we have access to what is below the surface, the surface, the atmosphere, also what we call the upper atmosphere when the solar wind interacts with the planet. And also we have been able to observe the two tiny moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. So to, to give an overview of the result is already all difficult after 10 years. But with the scientists of the mission, we, we discussed uh, over the last two years, and we have been able to come up with a top 10 scientific highlight. I will not go through the top 10, it will be a bit too long, but I can start with the beginning. And uh, the major uh, outcome of the mission was the discovery of what we call hydrated minerals. And there are special kind of minerals which were formed in the presence of liquid water. And it's very important because liquid water is uh, something very interesting to study uh, life on Mars. And the location of these minerals, um, we have been able also to, um, to give the age of the, of the past where the minerals have been formed. And we find that these special minerals have been formed in the early history of Mars. So that means liquid water in the stable form was present on the surface of Mars in the very uh, first part of Mars history. And that's important implications for the study of possible life on Mars. So that's one of the highlights. And uh, at the occasion of the 10 years, we have uh, released on the web and on the archive a global maps of all these minerals. So everybody can access these maps and try to, to locate uh, these minerals on the surface of the red planet. Another highlight, and I'm sure we'll come back to that later, was the controversial discovery of methane in the atmosphere. And especially there have been uh, some debate recently with the new result from, from MSL, and we might talk about that later. So in short, this discovery of methane indicates that the planet is active. There is some activity on the planet. So I'm sure there will be questions about that, so I don't develop too much on that. Another highlight that I wanted to explain is the, the detection of glacial landforms, so um, gl glaciers on the surface of Mars. And the interesting uh, part of that is that the location of these glaciers, they have been discovered at, at around the equator or at tropical latitude. So we should not find some, some glaciers at this latitude. And we have been able to explain the location of these uh, features by invoking a uh, change of the rotation axis of Mars. And that's an interesting um, implication for the change of the climate on Mars. So that's the three highlights. I can come back to that later, but at least that's a short summary of the main highlight of the mission. And Daniel, what about from your side, uh, with you and Michelle there over in operations? Um, do you have some operational highlights? Any particularly challenging observations, for example? Yeah, we do. And in fact, I'll, I'll pass over to Michelle. Of course, uh, we're the operations center. We're actually uh, controlling the spacecraft from here with the Mars Express uh, uh, flight control team. And Michelle is uh, well placed to talk a little bit about some of the uh, past operational highlights, the way the orbit has changed, uh, some of the cooperation we've done with uh, our partner uh, NASA, and uh, what we've got uh, uh, coming up in the, in the near future from the, from the spacecraft operations point of view. Michelle, over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Operational highlights, so we have plenty and certainly even more than 10. Uh, let, let me get, get three. I mean, wh one is the arrival of the planet. It's already almost 10 years ago. It'll be 10 years on Christmas Day. Uh, but still, it is something absolutely uh, extraordinary was for us uh, because it was the first European mission to capture another planet. It was all novel and uh, all very, very special event. Also, uh, retroactively may look simple, but it was also simple. We had to eject this little lander, which unfortunately didn't work, but it was as well part of a very complex sequence of operations. And uh, yes, this was one of the, the biggest highlights, just making it to Mars. Um, another big highlight uh, would be uh, now not just observing Mars, but observing Phobos. Because to observe Phobos, we pass very, very close to Phobos, and we have to for so-called radio science observation. We may come back to this later. And we did this in uh, 2010, in the third of Mars, and we'll do it again, uh, not on Christmas Day, but on the 29th of December this year, almost 10th anniversary of our arrival. 
and uh, passing by uh, such a big body, it's a small moon, but a big body, 30 kilometers diameter, at only a few tens of kilometers from its surface, and planning such a rendezvous years in advance on our reference orbit, and making it on the day as close as planned, but not closer, and in a safe way, this is quite a challenge. So fly dynamics and also on the Python tracking, and uh, we've seen in the past they can be not last minutes, but last few weeks surprises, like will we be close enough? And this year, okay, I will not unveil anything now, we should be as close as planned, uh, but we may need a little trim maneuver. So uh, this is uh, part of the suspense, and we are flying not with a joystick, but this is really a real, uh, real flight uh, operations and uh, uh, different from the routine, because as, uh, as Olivier said before, the primary objective of Mars Express, doing the coverage of, of Mars scientifically, uh, requires, of course, operations and planning which repeat and repeat and repeat over days and weeks, although we are, each orbit is a bit different. And this, before I come to my third highlight, I have a highlight in between. Uh, once of a scientist of uh, the Mars Express team said once, uh, each orbit of Mars Express is a little mission per se, because they are all a bit different, the distance of the sun, the availability of the data, of stations, uh, the viewpoint on the planet, on the atmosphere, and so on, they are all a bit different. And uh, so if each orbit is a mission, then we have only done 12,000 missions, which is a highlight per se. And the last one, you, you gave a hint at it, is uh, being able to cooperate uh, with our American colleagues, of course, on, with the data, uh, Deep Space Network, as we'll see maybe in a few minutes, using the their ground stations. And uh, conversely, by the way, we give them support with our station for their, for their launches, like the upcoming Maven, for instance, or the Juno flyby. And, uh, but at Mars, cooperating at Mars, relaying the data from their landers uh, during the descent or uh, on surface, uh, this is something which is for us still quite an achievement and uh, it's a complex operation, requires a lot of coordination with them and uh, technical skills and uh, we have made this uh, so far with, uh, okay, uh, the two MERS, the Phoenix, uh, Curiosity, so already four rovers have been uh, relayed on surface and two during this time, and being able to see in the data from the descent of these rovers, when they descend from the atmosphere, the expected profile, what we get see, can see from our uh, radio on board Mars Express is also something which we are, uh, I think we can be legitimately uh, proud of. Now, just, just, just as I understand this, so not only does Mars Express uh, relay uh, data during the entry, descent, and landing, but we're actually communicating with the NASA rovers from the surface. That's correct. So, uh, actually, we have, uh, for curiosity, uh, a sort of long-term service agreement for the duration of a mission, the provisional duration, which is one March a year, two, two, two years on, on Earth, where uh, they could any time come to us and say, oh, uh, these are guys, we have a problem with one of our orbiters or both, could you help for a few days, up to maybe a few weeks, and relay data regularly and send comments such that Curiosity, maybe on reduced mode, but to some extent can continue its mission. And for this, we have every other month, as we call them proficiency pass, so actually uh, in October and in December and then in February next year, we have a contact pass with Curiosity, where we relay just a bit of data, but just to be sure that everything works, everything's in place, the pointing of the spacecraft, the, the link budget, so the quality of the, of the radio communication, the quality of the data, and uh, we have been doing this since the arrival of Curiosity, and we continue till end of mission, or extended missions if required by NASA. And then, if they would have such a problem, they would call us and within, we promised within three days, but I think within one day, we could put aside the wonderful science mission we do for Olivia and his colleagues, and for a few days, up to a few weeks, uh, make a relay mission out of Mars Express and uh, transform it almost like this. Wow, that's very, very cool. Uh, <coughs> Before we go on, uh, on any further, I actually want to uh, jump in and just say uh, thank you very much, Olivia and Michelle, for those uh, those comments. Um, we have Emily Lactawala uh, with us from uh, from the west coast of the USA. Emily, uh, thank you very much again for joining us uh, so early in the morning. I'd like to toss over to you if I could, and uh, just see if you've got any questions that you'd like to pose to either Olivia or Michelle. And I know you're uh, you're particularly interested in uh, a little bit of our Phobos activity. And uh, what's been going on with uh, what, or what will be going on in the future with uh, not only Mars Express uh, but uh, some of uh, our 
on Europe's future mission, the ExoMars mission. Anyway, so I'll pass it over to you, and uh, uh, you can ask. Sure. Well, I, I am particularly interested in Phobos, and I'm wondering, um, I think that it would be excellent if, if you could explain, either Michelle or Olivier, about why is Mars Express so uniquely capable of observing Phobos compared to other missions that are at Mars? Olivier, do you want to start with the why, and I will say the how? Yes, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's start with the, yes, why uh, Mars Express is very unique. It's mainly due to, uh, to its orbit, because we know that, uh, we know at which altitude Phobos and Deimos orbit Mars, so Deimos is it's much further away. It's, it, the altitude is 22,000 kilometers above the surface, something like that, but Phobos, it's only... Uh, uh, a few tens of uh, thousands of kilometers, and with the Mars Express orbit, which is very elliptical, uh, the lowest point is uh, above 300 kilometers from the surface, and the highest point 10,000 kilometers. And in fact, just just with this information, we are able to to be very close to the to Phobos from time to time. Unlike the the NASA orbiter, which for, for because of their scientific goals and their capability. They have decided to have a, a circular orbit, 400 kilometers above the surface. They never can be very close to Phobos. So with the uh, orbit, which is elliptical, and also it's a polar orbit, which means we go above the pole almost at every orbit, with this special configuration of orbits, we are able to, to meet Phobos uh, more or less every five to six months. So that's why we are so unique, and in addition, uh, the instrumentation on board Mars Express, which was designed to study Mars, of course, it's also very, very well suited to study Phobos, and in a very original way, like with the radar, or with imaging spectrometers, with the gravity experiment, which were designed to study uh, Mars. In fact, they are very good also for Phobos. So that's at least a short answer to your, to your question. Michel, I don't know if you want to develop more. Yes. Um, what I wanted to say is, uh, yes, every five, five and a half months, we uh, fly by Phobos very closely, and so closely that one of our revolutions around Mars uh, intersects with uh, the Phobos orbit, and on that very uh, revolution, we have to be far away enough, or we would simply crash on Phobos. So actually, the closest observations are like the, if you wish, the orbit after the revolution before or the revolution after the crossing one. And the, the crossing ones, what we try to avoid, or we, we always avoid actually, is to have the, to the high poles and the crossroads at the same time. Otherwise, it would be a crash. So here we have safety rules such that even if we would lose contact with the spacecraft for a few days or a number of things would happen, then we, are, we have enough distance for that specific uh, orbit or revolution to avoid a crash. And on the ones which are before or after, we can, depending on the distance, take pictures uh, or spectrometric analysis or do the radio science special. And the radio science part uh, to uh, look in the interior of Phobos by analyzing its gravity field. This we can only do when we are very close, so below 100 kilometers uh, to determine the mass, and uh, below uh, 60 kilometers from the center to determine the gravity field. And this is what we intend to do in, uh, on the 29th of December. Being, uh, yeah. I'd like to emphasize to viewers just how close we're talking about. So I have my own little model of Phobos here. It's a paper model. You can see the, the huge Stickney crater right here. This long yep. axis is a bit less than 30 kilometers, and so we're talking about Mars Express being two of those away, just right here, passing by Phobos on these close one approaches. And half, one and a half, One and a half. But yeah, one and a half from this. So it's two from the center. Yes. yes. So it's uh, it's very close indeed, and it's as you say, it's a small moon, but it's a very large body. And I was reading the paper um, that has just been published um, on the sort of commemorating ten years of observations of Phobos, um, and it was news to me that that is uh, it is actually inevitable that the Mars Express spacecraft will one day crash into Phobos because that's just the nature of the two orbits. And this has actually been discussed as a way to intentionally dispose of the spacecraft. Is that? the actual end game plan for this mission once you've exhausted all of your resources, or, or what's the plan for that? Um, 
plan that I don't know because of course there are people from the planetary um, protection who see things a bit differently. Uh, you know, around Earth, people like to talk about the, the, the space Hoover, you know, the space vacuum cleaner. And uh, for us, for the Mars Express, uh, Phobos would be such a space vacuum cleaner and will be anyhow someday. So one could decide intentionally towards the end of, mission, of missions where, uh, to do a maneuver which with very little fuel would uh, control the crash on the mission at a given day such that we know that this thing is not flying for tens or hundreds of years because roughly in 500 to 1,000 years, Mars Express will crash statistically on Phobos. Uh, for future missions, uh, unmanned missions or maybe manned missions, people are considering manned mission to Mars or first even to Phobos because the gravity field being uh, is much lower, it's much easier with less energy to come back from Phobos. And uh, if I would have to fly there, I wouldn't like to raise something which can fall on my head <laughs> any, any moment. And uh, I think for the our responsibility with the future generation, we should think about this and make a trade-off between this requirement of uh, being safe for the future and of course the requirement of protecting uh, Phobos. The planetary requirements apply generally to bodies where life has or could have developed or could still develop. Phobos is probably out of this category, but it's for uh, people higher than me to decide. Yeah, we... If I can add something there. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. In the next futures, I mean, uh, uh, space agencies are thinking about a Phobos sample return. So they have been unfortunate the, the failure of Phobos ground, but there are there are other studies, uh, even in if ESA and also also on, on Russia. But uh, again, another mission to to bring some sample from Phobos because we would like really to know what Phobos is made of. One of the ideas is that Phobos can be made of Mars. So it's very important to have such a mission in the future. We'll see if, uh, if they will materialize. But if they materialize, uh, I guess the mission would like to know whether there is pieces on Mars Express on the surface of Phobos, because I guess they don't want to bring back some pieces of Mars Express on Earth. So I'm wondering, Olivier, if you can tell us, um, uh, given Mars Express really unprecedented survey of, of Phobos, what have we learned about Phobos that we didn't know before? Any uh, major surprises or differences from what we thought this little body was before Mars Express got there? Yes, I think the I have witnessed over the last five years uh, a very interesting thing, um, completely unexpected from uh, for me, is that a change of mind in the in the scientist. Because uh, uh, that. before Mars <laughs> Express, um, we were th we were thinking when uh, about Phobos that it's Phobos really looks like an asteroid. So everybody thought that it's a capture asteroid. It was pretty clear, I think, in the community. Uh, even w when I ask uh, some some colleagues here, so they all to tell me that Phobos is an asteroid. Full stop. Now with all the Mars Express data and the data analysis, which require for some of the data set a long time. After a while, uh, there have been many uh, PI team on Mars Express that claim that Phobos is not a capture asteroid. It's based on the infrared data, also the gravity data, which tell us something about the interior, how the interior of Phobos is, is, uh, is organized. Uh, near thermal infrared data, which tell us about the composition of the surface. And those teams that tell us that Phobos might not be a capture asteroid, but uh, has been formed in situ and most likely following a major impact on Mars which has ejected debris into space. Those debris form a disk and from such a disk you could uh, form Phobos and Deimos. And that, I think that's the, for me, the main, uh, the main change in the last 10 years uh, thanks to the Mars Express data analysis. Of course, the question is not settled. It's just some probability or at least some thinking of the scientist. With the Mars Express data, it will be difficult to, to close the, the question. We will really need a, a sample return, I think, to, uh, to answer that. But at least that's a major change that I have seen in the last 10 years, and it was quite interesting to, to follow that. 
Well, Phobos is very exciting, but of course Mars Express was sent there to study Mars, and so maybe we should return to to that planet. I'm wondering, um, you, know, you know, Mars Express has been publishing a great many amazingly beautiful images from the high-resolution stereo camera. That's the, the camera always gets all the news, but Mars Express has a lot of other instruments, and I'm particularly interested in the one that has the incredibly long antennae sticking out of the spacecraft. And I'm wondering if you can tell us what we have learned about Mars from Marsis, from the subsurface sounding. Okay, so the, this, this radar is a, it's a very special instrument because it works in two uh, main modes, and of course the radar sends some uh, radio signal towards the surface. Uh, the radar receives the echo back from the surface or from below the surface, and the analysis of the echo tell us uh, what is the structure of the of the what we call the subsurface of Mars. But there are two modes: one is for the subsurface, so to know what is below the surface, and another one is ionospheric mode, which uh, gives some information on the uh, distribution of electrons in the atmosphere. In other words. Um, how to characterize the ionosphere of Mars, which is an interesting component of the, of the atmosphere. So in short, the radar gives us information on the subsurface of Mars, and so below the surface, and what is happening above 80 kilometers. So it's a, very, it's a very special instrument for that. In the same instrument, you have access to what is minus something kilometers to plus 80 to 600 kilometers. So I think it's a very unique capability of the radar. So for what concerns the subsurface, I think the main outcome of the radar is the, uh, the sounding of the polar caps. Because we all know, you mentioned the beautiful images of the camera, we have beautiful images of the polar caps, north and south, but uh, with the radar we can penetrate below the surface and we can image in three dimensions uh, the shape of the polar cap. So we have seen, f as an example, the south polar cap is thick, uh, is a, uh, almost four kilometers thick. So we have the shape in 3D, and for the northern polar cap, we have uh, it's a little bit lower, something like two kilometers thick. So we have the shape, and we have also access to the composition, uh, and we find that the the material is mainly pure water ice. So it's also very interesting because the, we one of the goal of uh, missions to Mars is to uh, to follow the water, to explore all the water reservoirs in all forms, so liquid, uh, liquid we didn't find so far, solid also in the atmosphere. So to know that uh, the major reservoirs of water are in form of ice in the polar caps, it's very important for the global studies of, of Mars. So that's one of the, of the outcome. And for the ionosphere also there have been many studies which are much less known because the ionosphere is much complex to explain to the, to the general public. But uh, uh, there have been uh, thousands and thousands of data, and now the, we have a clear understanding on how the ionosphere behaves, what is the, the shape of the ionosphere, how the ionosphere responds to the solar wind. And it's also very important because um, uh, one of the questions for the Mars exploration is to understand how the atmosphere evolves through time, especially how the atmosphere was lost over the last 3.5 billion years, because now we know there is a thin atmosphere on Mars, and we believe that in the distant past, the atmosphere was much thicker. So one of the questions is, was the atmosphere lost into space uh, in the most of the history of Mars? And one, uh, one way of uh, knowing that is to study the plasma environment, including the ionosphere. So it's, it's very also important uh, in, uh, outcome of the Mars Express mission. So Mars Express has followed a lot of Mars's water to the poles, but the Omega spectrometer has also found a great deal of Mars's water locked up in minerals, the, these clay minerals and these sulfate minerals that, are, that it's found all over Mars. Um, and I think that one of the most exciting things that I've witnessed in the last few years of Mars exploration has been the shift in our understanding of how the history of water on Mars has changed over time, how that chemistry has changed over time. And Omega has been a really important part in telling that story, um, and also a great help in selecting landing sites for future missions, not just Curiosity, but Europe's future ExoMars rover to go and explore these places. Do you have particular um, places on the surface of Mars that you are keenly interested in exploring with uh, landed missions? Uh, you mean for ExoMars or in general? Or? Well, I, uh, either one, <laughs> whichever one fact, you like to uh, the, the question of landing site, it, it, it's a very 
complicated one because that, dep that really depends on what you want to do for a given mission. So if you want to, uh, to send a rover to Mars to search uh, for biomarkers or signs of past or uh, current life, uh, you need to select the adequate landing site. If you want to send a mission like the NASA InSight uh, mission, uh, we have also a similar study uh, ongoing at ESA to study the interior of Mars, you will land in a completely different place. So that's why the choice of a landing site is really detected to the scientific objective of the mission. And for any landing site, because as I said at the beginning, Mars Express have looked at Mars globally. We have a very uh, a global picture of Mars now with, with different instruments. And depending on the, the, the objective and where we want to land, we, we, we have the tools, the images, the data to select the best landing site. So now for the ExoMars rover, uh, which is due to, to launch in, uh, sometimes in 2018 and to, to land in, uh, sometimes in 2019, we want to search for biomarkers, signatures. And here, uh, we're based on all the discussion uh, for MSL. Uh, we know that we would like to land in a place where we find hydrated with minerals. So um, we have the global maps of hydrated with minerals. So for sure, I'm pretty sure that uh, without disclosing any confidential information, also there is no confidential information, it's just that we don't know the landing site yet, for sure we'll be landing in one of the spots of hydrated with minerals, that's pretty sure. Which one? Uh, I think we have not yet started officially the debate for ExoMars. In fact, the, the landing site uh, selection or working group should start in a few weeks or a few months from now. And that will be up to them to decide. But I, I'm pretty, uh, it's already clear that it will be one of the spots of hydrated minerals. I think uh, during the landing site selection process for Curiosity, there was one site in particular that was very strongly advocated by um, a fellow who is in charge of the uh, Omega instrument, that's, that's Marth Vallis, that has these amazing exposures of hydrated minerals. And I thought it was interesting. I'm sure that they were very disappointed that Curiosity did not go there. But now there's the opportunity for a European mission to go there. So that could yes, be very Yes, exciting. yes, yes. So we got a lot of, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say pressure, <laughs> but at least we got a lot of uh, information about this uh, site, which is called Mars Valleys, of course, from the Omega team. And also, there were a lot of colleagues in the US, I understand, that were also pretty interested by this site. Sure, sure. I think it's uh, one of the best uh, landing sites that we should consider. That's, that's clear. I'd like to uh, jump in if I could. And uh, Emily, I'll just, uh, we'll just pass over from you to our other Emily for a moment. And uh, I know um, uh, Emily Baldwin wanted to ask a couple of questions, or at least a question particularly related to a comet that is passing by, well, not too far, uh, not too close uh, from Mars in the next little while. Emily, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm sure lots of people on Twitter are following uh, the comet ISON. Oh, yeah. I, I should add, by the way, we, we're seeing lots of questions in, uh, in Twitter. Thank you very much. We'll get to some of those Twitter questions a little bit later in our, in our uh, webcast today. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, we've seen some, uh, some pictures from MRO already. What can we expect from uh, Mars Express in terms of data on ISON because the close approach of the comet um, to Mars was uh, just earlier this week. Yeah, in fact, well, it's a difficult question because we have not seen the data yet. And in fact, Michelle might comment on that. I understand that we should be receiving the data sometimes today. Uh, yes. Actually, I can look back and maybe we are receiving it now. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Oh, no, we are we are in between the passes. So actually, okay. in a few minutes, the data will 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 uh, start or continue coming. Actually, this um, uh, this Eisen uh, observations have been put in a normal science plan, but they've been like in addition to the observation of Mars. So they have generated extra data, and uh, with our overall dump planning strategy, which is meant not to lose any data, then the priorities make that this data basically we have we give. Um, preference to um, completeness over uh, latency, which is complicated the phrase to say we prefer to have all the data rather than having a bit quick. And uh, okay, this is how it works in Mars Express. And uh, we are getting the data uh, maybe with some, uh, some some delay here, and should be available uh, in the next few hours or days, and uh, will be processed. And I don't know probably possibly published by the, the science team, the camera teams, uh, early next week. 
And how, how is this helping to prepare for an even closer approach of a comet next year, Comet Siding Spring? Um, well, it puts us in the comet mood, but not in the comet mode. And uh, I'm going to explain this. Uh, because uh, Eisen passes at 10 million kilometers, which, uh, okay, the scale of scalar system is not much, but uh, the scale of a planet and the orbit of our surface is a lot. And uh, so we make observations which are like uh, observing uh, star rise or star set through the atmosphere for spectroscopy. It is a distant object, which is very interesting and not yet very active, uh, as I understand, and very far away. Next year will be a, a very, very different picture because we will be uh, experiencing a comet passing very close to, to, to Mars. The predictions are not fully consolidated, but we're talking rather 100,000 kilometers, so, on, so about 100 times closer. And uh, considering the usual expected size of uh, comet tails or coma, uh, most likely to, to the geometry as well, Mars and Mars Express orbit and the orbit of the, uh, of course, the NASA orbiters will be in the tail of a comet, which means may be exposed and will be exposed to some flux of particles. And uh, the question is to know how much, which size, and for how long. So here we will have to do, and we've started studies already, uh, coordinated also by, by Olivier with scientists for the analysis and the, and the prediction of the uh, comet models. Uh, we will have to make very special operations to protect Mars Express. Uh, we are thinking of uh, several things. One will be for 20 to 30 minutes, we can hide Mars Express behind the planet. So vis-a-vis -vis the direction of a comet. So really be protected from the flux of micrometeorites by the body of a planet. The question is, when do we exactly want to do this? And uh, how accurate is our information about the closest approach of a comet, such that we can really phase and put the Mars Express behind the the planet at the worst moment, if you wish. Mm -hmm. And uh, our geometry allows this. It doesn't allow to hide for more than 27 minutes. So then we'll have to get uh, out of the woods, if I may say so. And uh, for the remainder of a possibly dangerous period, which is estimated today to be maybe one or two hours, so longer than the 27 minutes we can hide, we will have to put Mars Express in a special attitude, which is being debated at the moment to protect best the solar arrays, the generator of electrical power, to uh, protect best the computers, to protect best the payload, the cameras, the instruments, to protect the star trackers, such that they are not confused by uh, the, the meteors, <laughs> so to speak. So this is actually a big, uh, much, much bigger uh, operation and strategy which needs to be developed uh, over the next few months, and uh, it may start with an orbit change that would kick off uh, early next year or in May next year, such that we, we consume as little fuel as possible to go to the new place in the orbit before the comet arrives. So this is a great big thing. Uh, ISON, in comparison, is uh, business as usual uh, on a more exciting object, but uh, operationally it was nothing special, I must say. No, otherwise, uh, what can we expect? Um, we have to see. I look forward to the to the data sent back by the PI teams. Uh, maybe during the weekend or on Monday, we have to see. But we we, we have prepared a, a, a particular observation plan for ISON. Uh, of course, Mars Express is designed to study Mars at 300 kilometers altitude. So to to observe ISON at 10 millions of kilometers, it will not be the same resolution, and will not get the same information. But nevertheless, I think we should get very interesting information. We should get an image from the camera. In fact, several images. Uh, several images. Uh, we have put in the plan several images to calculate the, also to take an image, of course, but to calculate the position of the comet and to improve the, the location and the ephemerides. And also, we have uh, switched on all the remote sensing instrument, so the Omega visible and imaging spectrometer. So we should get interesting information on the, uh, the composition of the, plan the planet. And also, we, we try to, and here I'm very curious about the result, we try, I think, for the first time uh, to perform what we call a stellar occultation with the tail of the coma. This is a, a kind of observation that we have done many, many times with Mars Express, and that was the first as well on Mars, and we have done the same at Venus. 
So we look at the image um, uh, of the, I mean the a star. Uh, on Mars and Venus, we look at the star through the atmosphere to get information on the composition of the atmosphere. And here we do the same with the tail of the coma. So I think that should tell us very inf information on how the tail is composed of, uh, what are the molecules, and I'm, I'm very curious about the result. Uh, Great. Speaking I wanna... of oh, yeah. on, uh, on composition, Daniel, perhaps we should turn to some of the popular questions on Twitter. And, I was uh, going to say, yeah, and I, I just wanted to warm Emily Lactawala. Uh, I think she has one, one more question. She had uh, indicated she wanted to ask about uh, future missions. And uh, Emily, we will get back to you, but uh, we've got quite a few questions here on Twitter. Yes, uh, I see the, one, the very first one that was posted, which you pointed out to me, um, Emily Baldwin. It's uh, coming from Jonathan Amos. And uh, he had said, uh, now that the dust has settled on MSL's methane results, can Olivier reflect on what they mean for MEX and for ExoMars 2016? OK, so the methane uh, story. I think we started this debate uh, back 10 years ago, because that was one of the first discovery of Mars Express. And I think we'll continue the, de the debate for the next 10 years, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. So the, the story is not over. Uh, what we understand from MSL is that MSL did not detect any methane. In fact, they, they have put an upper limit on the measurement. So we, basically, no methane has been detected uh, where MSL is, so at Gale Crater, another surface of Gale, for the first uh, 8 to 10 months of operations. So that's, uh, of course, we will, uh, we will have uh, been more... Uh, happy with the different result, but that is, this is what, what, what we have, it's a fact. So does that mean there is no methane on Mars? I don't think we can say that clearly, because methane can be first in another place on Mars, and as an indication, um, I have also spoken with the PFS team last week about that, the PFS team never detected methane over the Gale crater in all the history of the Mars mission, so that's also is coherent with the result of MSL. Uh, and so what we can say also that methane can be somewhere else and also somewhere else in the atmosphere because the measurement of MSL are at the surface or one meter above the surface to be very precise. But we don't know in fact if the methane will peak at another altitude. And there are some results of Mars Express which has not yet been published because it, they are quite complicated to, uh, to analyze in what we call in a limb mode. Uh, and the team uh, find that, yeah, in fact, when methane has been detected, the density peak at something like 20 or 30 kilometers altitude. So that's something that we know and we have to, to understand. It's not understood yet. So I think the, the dust has settled, maybe, but the question is still open. And I think the, we should really need a, a, an orbiter to measure methane at very high sensitivity over all the planet and at all Martian seasons and at all altitude. And I think only after that we should be able to say whether there is methane or not. And as far uh, as yeah. I was gonna say, as far as you know, will either India's Mars mission or the American Maven mission answer that question to sufficient sensitivity? Uh, sorry? Either uh, both India and America are about to launch new missions to Mars that are focused on the atmosphere. Do you know if either of those is going to answer this methane question. Uh, okay, so uh, Maven not, uh, because I think Maven is, uh, is mostly to, to study the plasma environment and the, the loss of the atmosphere in space. Uh, but there is just, as you said, the Indian mission, which embarked uh, so an instrument to measure methane. Unfortunately, I don't have access to the performance of the instrument, but uh, it might well be that this instrument, if it works and if it has sufficient uh, capability, it might answer the question, yeah. Otherwise, we are building ExoMars to hopefully uh, settle the question. Emily Baldwin, do you want to pick uh, any more Twitter uh, questions? There, there are quite a few, I see. Yeah, we've covered quite a few of the topics already. Um, but one popular one seems to be relating the Mars Express results to future missions in general. So we've talked a little bit about landing sites. Um, is there anything else we can say about how Mars Express is helping to prepare, for example, ExoMars or, or other missions? Yeah, for, for the next mission to Mars is, uh, is ExoMars, and ExoMars has two elements, one in 2016 and one in 2018. 
And the 2016 is the ExoMars orbiter, uh, and the goal is to, to measure the atmospheric chemistry, methane in particular, but not only all kind of uh, molecules which are interesting to, to know whether Mars is active or not. And uh, Mars Express is, is also uh, measuring the composition of the atmosphere. So all the measurement of Mars Express, in a way, prepare the future ExoMars trace gas orbiter mission, I think. And then for the rover, it's mainly with respect to the, to the landing site, what we said. We need to select the best landing site for this rover. And here, all the Mars Express data, in particular the camera and the Omega data set, will be key to, to find the, the best landing site. So at least there is a clear link a uh, clear link between Mars Express and the next two missions. After, after that, it's not clear what will be the next missions to Mars. Uh, we have some studies ongoing, but there is nothing decided yet. But I'm pretty sure that the Mars Express dataset, I mean, it's a huge dataset covering many, many investigations, and it's pretty clear that uh, all this data will be useful to prepare the next uh, missions, because every mission brings new questions. That's why we we prepare new missions, so that's already uh, one aspect. And then to prepare the new mission, we need to know what's going on on Mars, and the Mars Express data set will be quite useful with the, in this context. I see there's one question coming in from uh, Starling LX, who uh, is wondering, uh, now that uh, uh, Mars Curiosity found no methane, what does that say about life on Mars? And I, I'd be curious, uh, Emily uh, Lakdawalla, what you've heard on the US side about the, that's the sort of the longer term implication of what the recent uh, methane results are, uh, are pointing to. Well, as with the question of water on Mars, you have to be very careful when you're discussing life on Mars. Are you talking about present life or past life? Um, I think most scientific investigation of life on Mars is focused on the period in Mars's history when it was more hospitable to life, which was a long time ago, very interested in past life. Methane discoveries on Mars have occasionally been linked to the possibility that there are methane producing bacteria, but that's a very long chain of speculation that leads you there. So I think that the curiosity non-detection of methane doesn't really say very much about life on Mars. I don't think it makes it uh, very much more likely or less likely than there is or was life on Mars. So um, uh, discovering life in ancient Earth rocks is extremely challenging. It is no less challenging on Mars except for the fact that Mars has an awful lot more very ancient rocks than Earth does. So in a strange way, it's actually a better place to go investigate the possible origins of life on a rocky planet. Um, so I think that there's still a lot more to be uh, investigated there. I think Curiosity is on the right track of looking for the environments where life could have thrived, and hopefully ExoMars will be doing a similar kind of study in a very different kind of location that also features hydrated minerals. And we can explore this question of, of past Mars and how life may or may not have originated there. Great, thank you. Oh, Olivia, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, uh, maybe about the, the link between methane and, and, and life. So Emily said it quite, quite well. In fact, uh, uh, we need to distinguish between past and present life. and the, the current presence of methane might point to current life. But there is an interesting aspect, um, uh, it's still under investigation of course, is that uh, past life could have generated methane, and then this methane could have been trapped somewhere on the planet, below the surface, or in the form of ice that we call clatrate. So it could be, uh, and this methane could be released epi episodically through seasonal variations, so the methane that we could detect, or that we have detected, possibly, could also come from uh, ancient past uh, life. That, that's an interesting uh, question. I don't I know the answer, of course. I think one of the coolest discoveries of Mars Express was, as I think was the second one you mentioned, Olivia, this, this glacial, these glacial features near uh, Mars's equatorial latitudes, and it, it points to a kind of geologic activity on Mars that has continued right down to near the present day. Every time Mars's axis tilts over, we get this ice migrating around and shifting and changing features on the surface of Mars. Mars Express has really shown us how dynamic geologically the surface of Mars is, even today when it looks like this cold, dead desert world, and you can have things happening like this release, this possible release of methane that's been locked in ice for a very long time. Yeah, right. And in addition, we also find that with the crater canting on, on some volcanic uh, edifice, 
we also find that there have been some very recent volcanic activity. Recent means a few million years ago, which in the, if we compare to the whole history of Mars, it's very recent. So it's also an, uh, an additional outcome of Mars Express. So, yeah. I see there's one, uh, one question posted by David Todd Howard via Twitter, and uh, it's an ops question, so I'm uh, passing this over to, to Michelle. He's asking, was the original Mars Express mission only expected to last for one year? Uh, how much longer can we expect it to last? Yes, <laughs> question dear to my heart, or so mine. Um, <laughs> it was uh, planned uh, actually to be there for one month of year, so two years of year, and uh, had fuel in principle and reserves for two months of year, so four years of year. And uh, actually because of, um, well, luck in a number of, of situations and also good practice, good operational practice, practice being very economical and careful with the usage of resources, resources being the fuel, of course, the, the way we use the batteries, because the battery technology we have doesn't allow reconditioning and the battery capacity degrades over time, slowly, but unfortunately, surely. So uh, we have managed to come to 10 years, and we can envisage a horizon of six, eight years from now, uh, seeming the fuel, not not the fuel being the, 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 limit, the limitation, although we make independent studies now to confirm this, but possibly the batteries. The, every now and again, actually quite a number of, of uh, orbits are concerned by eclipses, which means that the spacecraft goes behind Mars, and uh, during a few tens of minutes as we survive on batteries, and with the degrading capacity of batteries someday, uh, when the space force comes out of the eclipse, uh, then actually it uh, will have uh, undergone a general undervoltage. The whole system will be uh, reset. In principle, it can restart by itself, but uh, even if it works well, uh, seven hours later, there is another eclipse, which would again send it into this sort of nirvana. So from that point onwards, even if the spacecraft survives and resurrects every six and a half hours, there is no way we would be able to do uh, a lot of science operations in any case. Uh, at the moment, we don't predict this happening before maybe the, well, the end of a decade if everything goes well. Now one has to consider this is a small spacecraft. And uh, every day, every orbit, every minute of observation is already a bonus in a sense. And if, well, touch wood, Mars Express <laughs> would, would, would die tomorrow, nobody would have done the wrong job. And either in operations or in industry, everybody could be extremely proud. And somebody was asking me the question uh, last week, what would you do? I said, I would open a bottle of champagne to say, <laughs> we made it, we made it that long. There's no point to cry. Yeah? And uh, but of course, we all are working uh, steadily to uh, prolong the life of this spacecraft as long as possible, and the life of its instruments, such that the science not only is desirable, but also doable, and uh, that we can the financing accordingly for the many years to come. If um, I can ask a follow-up yeah. to that question. I know that Mars Express suffered a very serious memory fault last year, um, and I understand that most of the science operations have been recovered. Can you tell me um, what, if anything, is different about operating Mars Express now than it was before this memory fault happened? Oh, yeah, the technical question, so close to the end. Uh, I try to answer <laughs> simply, a simple way. Uh, actually, now we operate, uh, as you would say, file-based. Everything is done with individual files of activities, which are predefined on ground. And the nice thing with this is that if a file cannot be loaded from this mass memory, then the activity is just not executed, and the spacecraft goes to the next activity. And there is no safe mode, so this means the spacecraft doesn't go into any degraded mode. There is no fuel loss. Nothing bad happens. Simply, we are missing a few observations. And actually, we have added some extra layers of autonomy such that when such a glitch occurs, because the, the root cause of a glitch we cannot change, and it still occurs a few times per year, then we have an onboard automatic program which detects the glitch and reconnects the mass memory within one to two seconds. So what at the beginning was, uh, as a consequence, three days of data loss at least, plus an equivalent of fuel of half a year. Now there is no fuel loss, and only one second of data is lost. So this is really a different way of operating. And uh, But of course, we had to trickle down all this uh, operational system into our planning and software tools on, on, on Earth. 
such that uh, every everybody talks this file language, which actually has other advantage, uh, which uh, came uh, in a serendipitous manner, uh, but we enjoy every day. Okay. Great, thank Good you. Good job. If I can add uh, something to to this, we, we often call uh, uh, Mars Express a routine mission, because after 10 years, uh, people say, well, you do always the same thing, it's routine. But after working a few years on Mars Express, I can tell you that it's far from a routine mission. Every year, there is something happening, even a technical problem, like the one on the affecting the mass memory, or a close for both flyby, or an observation of the comet. Uh, next year, the comet encounter. Then next year, we plan joint observation with MAVEN, uh, the new spacecraft from NASA. So there is always something happening, and it's very far from a routine mission. Emily Baldwin, I'll just uh, pass over to you for a final question uh, before I go over yeah. to Dr. Wola. Like, yeah. A great one has just come in uh, from JP Coatsy on Twitter. What have the Mars Express observations taught us about Martian weather? Something else which isn't usually routine. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Martian weather, yes. Uh, in fact, they, they are, well, the, the atmosphere is very thin, so we should ask the question, is there a Martian weather at all? Because the pressure is so small. And in fact, there is a very interesting weather system on Mars. Also, the, uh, there was a very uh, interesting detection or discovery of Mars Express is the discovery of new type of clouds on the uh, that affect the weather on Mars. We know there have been uh, uh, water ice cloud because there is water vapor in the atmosphere. So, But the new th uh, observation of Mars Express I've shown a few years ago that there is also a new kind of cloud called uh, carbon dioxide house cloud, or CO2 house cloud. This is really a new discovery, and I think not many people know about it, so we should promote it much further. And this cloud, they are very important uh, for the climate of Mars, especially in the past, when we think the atmosphere was thicker. There may have been more this, uh, this kind of clouds, and those clouds have an effect on the temperature of the atmosphere, greenhouse effect, and so on that might explain uh, um, what happened on the surface in terms of liquid water and so on. So that's one of the, I would say, from my point of view, for the atmospheric studies, a major discovery of Mars Express. Great. Good. I wonder if we could pass over to Emily Lakdawalla. Uh, we're getting down to our last five, maybe ten minutes max. Uh, we're almost over an hour. But uh, you had mentioned uh, you wanted to ask a little bit about uh, ASA's future future plans and activities for Mars. And of course, we have Michelle here, who is the, the ground segment manager for, for ExoMars. Anyways, I'll pass over to you. You can ask the, uh, the final couple of questions. Well, I know that, that uh, the, the United States future plans for Mars keep on coming back to sample return. I'm wondering whether the European Space Agency has plans for Mars sample return um, or plans to cooperate with other countries on trying to do that, or whether your priorities for future Mars exploration lie somewhere else. Oh, maybe Olivier knows better than me. What I can say is that there are some plans, I think Olivier mentioned them too, to, there are European plans working on the, the study for Phobos sample return that could take place in the mid-20s, so at least 10 years from now, or a bit more. Uh, this would be a first step uh, trying to do what Phobos Grant unfortunately didn't manage to do uh, last year. Uh, for the mass sample return, then this would be yet another step, uh, but definitely in cooperation with, with other nations, although I'm not sure, I don't think the scene is set yet of this. Olivier, do you have more to add? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think the, the sample return is also in the long-term plan of, of the European Space Agency. It's the, the mission is not yet decided, but that's, that's the, the end goal of the mass exploration also on our side. But it's so complicated that in between we, we, we prepare uh, some steps in between. So we have ExoMars, and then there are, there are two missions under study, which uh, one is uh, mentioning, mentioned by Michel, the Phobos sample return, because we could test the mechanism of bringing something from the Martian system. But Phobos is, for many reasons, it's much easier to access than Mars. So that would be an interesting step. Another mission under consideration is to land something on Mars, um, and it will be a network mission, so to study the weather system the inter and the interior of Mars with a network of uh, two or three or four stations. So that will be some steps uh, to prepare the long-term goal, which is indeed the Mars sample return. 
I think that a fact that, that some people may not appreciate is that if you do manage to do a sample return from Phobos, I think studies indicate that up to a few percent of that material that's retrieved from Phobos would actually have come from Mars in the first place as ejecta from impacts on Mars. So we wouldn't know where on Mars it came from, which is one of the reasons we want to do Mars sample return, but it would still be a way to pick up samples of Mars from space and bring them back to Earth. Sure, I think that's one of the arguments uh, that I uh, brought forward by the uh, scientists and engineers preparing this Phobos sample return. In fact, as you said, bring, bringing back samples from Phobos uh, might uh, include uh, something from Mars. After, the, the, the difficulty might be to, to detect which part of the sample are from Mars, which part are from Phobos, but I think that's another story. I wonder if I could jump in with, actually, there were a couple of questions posted in our, uh, in our Hangout uh, event. And one of them is, uh, I'll, I'll say what they are first, one of them is, has Marsis been used to analyze Phobos and or Deimos? And the second question, which I think we can answer very uh, 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 quickly, the second question is that uh, uh, Mars is cold, uh, the core is cold, resulting in no magnetic field. How to protect humans on Mars? And I guess actually one of the, uh, the extensions of that question is, what are we learning from a planetary scientific investigation uh, via robotic missions either uh, NASA or ESA, which is going to, to w w that will help us with it with some sort of future human mission. And I wonder if uh, Emily and or Olivier would want to respond to that. Okay, so maybe the first part for Marcy's about the study of uh, Phobos and Deimos with the radar. So for Deimos, the response, the answer is no, simply because we are always too far from Deimos. And to operate the radar, we need to be uh, within 400 kilometers of the target. And uh, it's just not possible with Deimos. But with Phobos, we have acquired a lot of data from the radar. Uh, the thing is, uh, no paper has been published yet because the data analysis is quite complex. Because the radar has been designed to work on, for Mars, and it's already quite complex. So to work on Phobos, it's even more complex to understand, especially because of the uh, complicated topography of the moon. If you see the shape of the moon, which is behind me, uh, it's not a, a ball, uh, it's not a very smooth surface, and every part of the surface are able to, to, uh, to send back an echo towards the satellite. So the, that's why the data analysis is quite complex, and there is no definitive result yet. Also, we, we have uh, clear echoes from the surface, and maybe from, from the subsurface of Phobos, but uh, that needs still uh, confirmation. So there are some interesting data sets, potentially extremely in interesting, but yet not completely analyzed. So that's for the Marsis. Then there was the question of uh, how the data will prepare the human exploration of Mars. So that's it's a even more long-term study uh, compared to to Phobos uh, uh, to the Mars sample return. In, uh, so I don't know exactly how to answer that, but... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try swinging out an answer to that. <laughs> so um, one, of the, one of the ideas that actually uh, uh, one of the leaders of the Planetary Society espoused many years ago, and which I still think is a very exciting possibility for human exploration of Mars, comes back to Phobos. Because one of the big problems with human exploration of Mars is survival on the surface of Mars, getting down to the surface of this planet, getting back up. Phobos is like an orbiting, could be made into an orbiting station from which humans could actually joystick machines in real time exploring across the surface of Mars. It would be a wonderful way to get humans and robots working together to take advantage of both of their capabilities, human brains and robot brawn, to explore Mars's surface. And so Mars expresses um, incredible understanding now, the mapping of the surface, the detailed knowledge we have, we can plan landing sites. So I think that in a way, um, if, if that's the way that we wind up doing human exploration of Mars, Mars Express has certainly st set the stage for that with its studies of Phobos. So it's, it's sort of an off-the-wall answer, but I think it's kind of fun to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Emily. I think that's probably a perfect note to uh, finish up our, uh, our discussion today. I want to start off by uh, thanking my co-moderator, Emily Baldwin in STEC for uh, joining us today and helping uh, organize a, uh, uh, things online can sometimes be a little bit uh, chaotic. I want to thank uh, Olivier uh, Vitassi, the uh, Mars Express Project Scientist, and Michelle Denis, our Spacecraft Operations Manager here at uh, ESOC. And of course, I'd like to thank Emily Lactawala, who uh, is joining us. It's uh, not quite as early in the morning now, but uh, uh, she probably still needs to rush off and get uh, another cup of coffee. I know I certainly uh, have to. 
And uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, from the Planetary Society. And uh, it's been great. The uh, for those of us watch for those of you watching in the uh, online, the video of this uh, chat will be available both in the ASA Google Plus channel and in the ASA YouTube channel, which is uh, YouTube.com/esa. Rather easy to remember. And uh, please follow Emily, Emily Lakdawala on Twitter. Uh, look at the Planetary Society. Uh, she's blogging over there quite regularly. Please follow uh, ESA via Google+, via our website, via Twitter. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you very much uh, to, our, to our guests uh, for, for taking part today. Thanks, Daniel. I, I, I think I pressed the button. Yes. Now we, we cut. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Olivier thank and uh, Emily. And uh, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thank you.